Hello and welcome to Nevermind the Bar Charts with myself, Mark Pack, for the final show of 2022. And who better to have back than the show's popular repeat return guest, the man who is to this show what Nicholas Courtney was to Doctor Who, Professor Tim Dale. <laughs> I've asked Tim back on the show so he can do another review of how Labour and the Lib Dems are matching up against the list of five things an opposition party must do, which we first discussed back in 2020. So welcome back to the show, Tim. Well, thanks very much, Mark. I hope I'm not going to be the Grinch that steals any particular opposition party's Christmas. <laughs> I'll include in the show notes links to the earlier shows, but for listeners who are newer or haven't got quite as good a memory as to exactly what those five tests were, we will step through them one by one. So the first one that you had highlighted, or rather you, I think this the, the tests actually came from another academic, didn't they? But you had spotted them as being a useful tool. The first test for opposition party success was having fresh faces signifying a generational shift in politics. So how do you think Labour and the Liberal Democrats are doing on that score? Yeah, I mean, I should just say, yes, these five tests really come from Stuart Ball, who is a, a great historian of the Conservative Party in the earlier part of the 20th century and some work that he did actually with Anthony Selden who's also done a great deal of work on you know, how governments fall and how oppositions get back. So in terms of fresh faces, um, well, actually, we've not had a huge number of those in recent times. I think, to use a football analogy, it seems to me that Keir Starmer in particular now has a pretty good idea of who his first team is going to be going into the next election, whenever that is, even though it's quite a long way away. And certainly in the, if you like, electorally most vital uh, posts so you know we've got we're treating at health for example i can't see a move there we've got rachel reeves i mean i think she is absolutely nailed on as shadow chancellor and indeed as chancellor if labor win it's difficult to see him moving anybody in in the sort of great offices of shadow positions so uh, you know there there aren't that many i think labor mps who we don't already know about coming through and making a big impact in the media that actually is probably how Keir Starmer wants it in some ways, because one of the ways of making an impact is sometimes to be a bit of a rebel. And, you know, we'll, we'll go on to talk a little bit about discipline and unity a bit later. And as far as the Lib Dems are concerned, I mean, I don't, I haven't personally noticed, you know, any, any new people really coming through. I mean, I think they're just trying to make the best of the resources that they've got. And of course, for the Lib Dems, you know, those, lim those resources are quite limited, not in terms of the personalities involved, but simply in terms of, you know, the number of MPs that they've got able to convey messages. And some of those are very familiar. So, for example, today, when we're speaking about the reopening of deep coal mining near Whitehaven, for example, it's Tim Farron because it's near his constituency. He's popping up and talking about, you know, the lunacy of that idea. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, Gordon Brown has, <laughs> has been uh, very much in the news as well this week with uh, his, his commission. So, you know, blasts from the past can sometimes be effective as long as they don't remind people of, of the bad times. And I think there might be a risk of that with Gordon Brown, but I'm sure Labour are hoping that's not the case. Yeah, I, I guess the key factor to add on this test is that for the public, who generally don't pay very much attention to politics at all, I, I suspect both Labour and the Liberal Democrats do seem like quite a collection of fresh faces in that if you take, say, with the Liberal Democrats, obviously our leader, Ed Davey, as previous cabinet minister, being an MP for quite a long, long time now in total. So you might say not so much a fresh face, but for most people following politics, there is a sense of, yeah, he is somebody different from the current lot. And I think for Labour, you know, Keir Starmer's front bench isn't stuffed full of people who were previously ministers or cabinet ministers under Labour. Prime Minister, you know, in that sense, some of the names, Keir Starmer himself included, have in many ways been around for quite a few years. But it does feel like this would be yeah, the, a new Labour cabinet would be very different from a previous. Yeah, Labour I cabinet. guess I guess the one exception to that would be the band mm. who, you know, as far as Labour supporters go, is, you know, actually a bit of a hero, even though he lost them the, the 2015 election in part. 
I mean, it might be that some voters with long memories look at Ed Miliband and think, oh, no, not him again. But I, I doubt there are many of those. I think you make a very good point, really, as it begins to look as if Labour and possibly the Liberal Democrats might have a role in forming the next government. I think people begin to look at them anew who hadn't bothered to look at them at all, really, beforehand. So, I And think likewise, I think right. with the Lib Dems, you know, although Ed Davies been around for a while, people, I think, will associate what happened in, say, Coalition very much with Nick Clegg and maybe Vince Cable and what the party's been through since with perhaps Tim Farron, Vince Cable, Joe Swinson. Tim, as you say, is still still there, you know, still still diligently working away very impressively in Parliament. But but it feels like it's a different cast of characters. And so yes. I think there is a bigger change than maybe those on the inside in politics, perhaps. always. Yes, appreciate. And, uh, <laughs> And the other thing that parties can do is obviously introduce some of their new candidates and that can make a difference perhaps to people's perception of the parties. I mean, I'm talking to you, as you well know, down in Eastbourne and we, we have a candidate there, Josh Barber in there, who is, you know, um, being touted by the, the leadership as, you know, one to watch. You know, this is an important marginal versus the Conservatives. You know, and there, there are a number of new Lib Dem candidates who, in some ways, because the party doesn't have that many MPs, can possibly fulfil mm. that function. And, you know, the, the more that the, the Lib Dems can do to promote those those candidates and those fresh faces, the better, I think. Yeah, I, I think there's also an interesting subplot that may just be Westminster insidery gossip, but there's an endless trickle of speculation about whether former Labour ministers will seek to make a return to the House of Commons, Ed Balls or David Miliband. And I mean, you'll be in a much better place to judge this than me, given given you've written about the Labour Party mm-hmm. and have much better Labour sources <laughs> than I do. But it does seem to me unclear why Keir Starmer would want names from the past to return in that way. Yes, I mean, in some ways, you know, any sign of desperation for them to come back would indicate that he's not sufficiently confident about the people he's got around him at the moment. And I I don't think that is the case. And I'm not sure if I were Keir Starmer, I would be particularly comfortable with someone like David Miliband, who's often seen as the prince across the water, Mm. (laughs) coming back in into the party in Parliament not least because, you know, for some people, he might pose a little bit of a threat to Keir Starmer's leadership were things to go wrong, particularly once Keir Starmer was was Prime Minister. So I'm not, you know, in Keir Starmer's mind, he might be perfectly happy to welcome back David Miliband, but you can see from the outside why that may be a little bit awkward. So that certainly suggests that, that Labour is taking the sort of fresh faces issue seriously. And I think we'll probably come to the same conclusion on the next test about showing unity and discipline that the traditional thought, backed up also by lots of evidence, is that voters generally don't like divided parties and showing unity and discipline, therefore, for an opposition party is an important part, being a successful opposition party. I mean, I guess the most striking thing in this respect with Labour is the ruthlessness with which parliamentary selections are being managed. And it does seem like Keir Starmer's taken a very clear strategic choice of not to pick a fight other than with Jeremy Corbyn, but otherwise not to pick a fight with left-wing MPs, but to absolutely minimise the number of new left-wingers who would enter the parliament. And therefore, if Labour has anything better than a disastrous election result, there'll be a whole influx of new MPs that will quite significantly change the political balance of the parliamentary party, whilst only having had to pick up you know, a, a fight with one existing MP. That seems to me a very clear and really quite ruthlessly deployed plan that's been rolling out through their selections. Yes, I mean, I think you're quite right about both sides of that plan, actually. You are right that Labour's managing the selection process to ensure that those coming in and new are going to be quite supportive of the leadership. Of course, you can you can never completely predict whether that will be the case yeah. because some people um, change once they get into Parliament. And you're right about the other side of that, which is, you know, there are left-wing MPs, members of the Socialist Campaign Group, etc., who, you know, haven't been subject to great pressure to stand down. I mean, there are some, obviously, individual contests where, you know, thorns in the side of the Labour leader have been or might be cast aside by their own constituency party. And Sam Tarry is the obvious one that, that's already happened there. But, you know, there, there are plenty of left wingers. Zara Sultana, for example, is a, a, is a good example who have had absolutely no trouble in getting reselected. So I, I think it's being handled quite well. There are obviously some complaints 
uh, from left wingers who feel that they've been shut out of the selection process or unjustifiably left off short lists, for example. But I think it's very difficult for those people to get much traction because you know they don't have much public presence so you're, you're quite right I think on terms of the, the candidate selection we're seeing that but the other aspect of course of, of this unity and discipline point is um, he seems to have so far anyway and we can't guarantee that you know with the potential winter of discontent this will continue prevented Labour MPs left right and centre joining picket lines for example or saying anything too out of turn on those industrial disputes, you know, putting themselves really behind the strikers against the government. Labour seemed to be running this line that the government could do more, Labour would do more, but actually not saying what more Labour would actually do. But so far, that line seems to be holding. So I think that's been quite effective. And actually also on other issues, the EU is another one, and that's something we might come back to, where you, you might imagine, given the way that public opinion has turned on the EU in terms of, you know, people thinking it was a bad idea mm. to have left uh, versus people who think it was the right thing mm. to have done, you might see more Labour Europhiles pressing Keir Starmer to say something more positive about Britain's relationship with the EU. But, you know, although some, some people are calling for that, Keir Starmer doesn't appear to be budging on that at all, nor do any of those around him. So, that's that's been, I think, you know, quite impressive if you think that unity and discipline are important. And is that though because he's getting things right or because he's riding high in the polls? And I know the two are not unrelated, obviously, but I I struck on the issue about the appear MPs appearing or not appearing on picket lines, for example. That as you say, I think he seems to be able to hold the line with his colleagues much more effectively this time around than previously. And actually, that slightly surprised me. But thinking about what's changed, therefore, why is he being more successful this time? Is it not just simply he's, much, you know, he's doing a lot better in the opinion polls and that that sense of actually of is he likely to be the next prime minister makes a huge difference to the credibility and the power of a leader of the opposition. And therefore, if, you know, the Tories bounce back a bit next year, for example, a lot of the things we've just you've just mentioned might going backwards. Yeah, I mean, I think that's undoubtedly right. Clearly, if these feel that their leader is about to become prime minister and therefore is going to be able to exercise all sorts of patronage, then they're going to be much more willing to support him on the way up. Uh, that mm. you know, doesn't just apply to Conservative mm. MPs, who are very often seen as quite instrumental in that respect for good reason. It also applies to to Labour MPs. So uh, I think you're right. You know, the, uh, an opinion poll lead obviously gives Keir Starmer you know more confidence in the way he presents himself. But I think it does also mean that a lot of Labour MPs who you know may have had doubts before are now definitely hitching their wagon to uh, to Keir Starmer because they see him as as the next Prime Minister, you know, and given what the opinion polls are telling us and given how difficult it will be for the Conservatives to actually dig themselves out of this crater that they've fallen into, they're they're probably right in that respect. Another aspect of this actually which is quite interesting is that as you know, the economic news gets worse, and indeed, you know, the news on public finances is is quite dire as well. We haven't seen that many MPs come out and you know challenge the idea that you know there is a a black hole mm. uh, that it needs to be filled, that Labour can't make too many promises, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, even though some professional economists would actually deride that that whole idea, and no doubt some people on the left of the Labour Party, you know, are, are very concerned about that narrative. And taking hold and in some ways limiting what the Labour government or future yeah. Labour government can do. But still, most people seem mm. to be going with Keir Starmer's line, which is very, very cautious. Yeah, and, and perhaps that's the more most surprising element is the lack of debate around or dissent, apparent dissent around economic policy in the Labour Party, given what a large part of the Labour tradition, <laughs> in a way, such disagreement is. Uh, but also, I think... You know, one of one of the judgments, as you say, people often make in politics is about deciding not to argue over something because maybe it's just going to get in the way of winning or maybe it's going to get in the way of you getting a job from the leader if you win, you know, if, if your side wins. Economic policy, though, is so central to winning or not and what you achieve if you're in office that that's that's the one where it's more surprising if people put to one side their disagreement and so what's your sort of take on is it because there isn't that much disagreement or that people 
feel it's not the right time to make have some of these arguments within Labour or why, why that relative quietness? Well, I mean, I think it is partly to do with the fact that they don't want to rock the boat because at the moment Labour is so far ahead that, you know, they, they really don't feel that, you know, criticising that policy would, would be particularly helpful at the moment. I, I think as well, it, it could be that actually what happened to Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng at the hands of the markets and maybe has reinforced the idea that you can't simply ignore, you know, the, the outside world, as it were, and that Labour does have to be careful about over-promising and, you know, scaring people, not only in the electorate, but also in the markets, and therefore does have to run this kind of cautious approach. I mean, I think people will also look back, you know, we're both historians originally, mm. to, you know, the, the 1992 uh, election mm. where Labour did lay out an awful lot, for example, in the shadow budget mm. and, you know, were probably punished for it. Whereas going into 1997, they were super cautious. And some people would say, you know, too cautious. Mm. But, you know, it, it didn't do the party any yeah. harm at the election. What you can argue is that, of course, it led to Labour being rather too cautious once it had won that election, mm. you know, in the first two years. And I, I think that is what some people in the Labour Party worry about, that, that in in you know being very disciplined in the run up to the election they will actually circumscribe what they do if and when they they yeah. win it's whether Keir Starmer you know has and Rachel Reeves ha, have more up their sleeve as it were that they're not willing to reveal i think that's I wonder yeah perhaps also weirdly this is a very counterintuitive legacy of Jeremy Corbyn era because if you look at Labour's 2019 manifesto and this is probably more John McDonald's influence i guess than Jeremy Corbyn's but fiscally, it was in some ways very small C conservative. If you look at how narrow the range of people who would have been affected by the proposed tax rises in that manifesto were, or indeed how limited the additional spending of money on benefits mm. could be. Mm. You know, it, I, I, I remember being really struck looking, looking through Labour's 2019 manifesto and thinking, they're not even wanting to raise taxes on me. <laughs> you know, it, you know, it, it it was a very new Labour 1997 ethos in many ways, although it had the John McDonald stamp on it. And obviously yeah. there were other much more left wing elements yeah. in the manifesto, but perhaps that sense of playing to sort of fiscal rectitude is the necessary price for socialism. Maybe that's actually become a more deeply embedded yes. part of the left wing train of thought yeah. in the Labour yeah. Party. And I, and I mean, I think, you know, going to your wider question about, you know, the, the the way that people are cooperating with Starmer. I mean, I, I think, you know, after this many election defeats, I think people begin to think, you know, they will do almost anything mm. uh, to win. And, and if that means, you know, shutting up to some extent, mm. then, then they will do that. I mean, I was at a few weeks ago, an event held down here in Sussex in Lewis, the, you know, the county town, actually run by the Labour Party. But there were a lot of Lib Dems and Greens there as well about dismantling the blue wall. Mm. And that was a the theme of the, the, the conference. Jonathan Friedland also came down and, and did a talk. As a good political the scientist, a little bit of you must die inside every time the phrase blue wall is used i feel i should apologize on behalf of the lib dems but it is it although it is maybe not intellectually rigorous a, a classification it is a very useful yeah. general phrase yeah. in, a, in a rough and ready way isn't yeah. it very useful and I, and, I, and I think what really struck me there was that a lot of the labor people who turned up i'm sure would have been previously quite enthusiastic about jeremy corbyn but they were willing to listen to me they were willing to listen to jonathan friedland for example who really took no prisoners <laughs> and you know that they essentially agreed with him in, in some ways so what I, I think has happened to the Labour Party is obviously that some of those Corbyn supporters have been burned off and, and, and left but I think you know there are a, a great many pre-existing Labour members who supported Corbyn and who now think well okay it was it was worth a shot but really now we've got to <laughs> we've got to get back into the game and if that means following what Keir Starmer is suggesting then that is what we're going to do. Yeah I, I mean I as I think one of the things, and I've said this on the podcast before, it's always worth remembering about any political party is people in any one party always find elements of pe what people in other parties do or think baffling. And that's just part of the natural sort of myopia that overcomes anyone who's too active in politics. Mm. But I do find the Labour left really intriguing in that respect, partly just how quickly and apparently relatively easily mm. 
Starmer undid the Corbynite grip on the Labour organisation and machine and all of that. But also, and this I think is particularly important from a you know Lib Dem perspective, thinking about what might happen in terms of chances of electoral reform for the House of Commons and so on in future, is a, a lot of the people in momentum that I've encountered seem to be genuinely pluralist, yes. which is absolutely not the word I would have traditionally used for the left of the Labour Party. And if you think about, you know, the great sort of British political TV dramas about politics and so on, and your classic portrayal of left wingers in them, you know, kind, gentle pluralism is not, you know, is not the character. And so there does seem to have been whether it's a generational shift or it's an ideological change, but there does seem to have been a, a, a potentially a quite a meaningful shift in the Labour left's attitude, which in terms of what the future might be for things like electoral reform, I think is quite important because in the past, one of the reasons why electoral reform for the House of Commons has 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 never quite been seen through however many reports in opposition the Labour Party has done, has been that it's in Labour terms been a right wing policy, you know, for mm. something from the right of the Labour. And that doesn't seem to be the case anymore. But it does leave me just a bit I, I need you to write a book about the Labour left to explain it to me, Tim. Well, I do wonder, I mean, I, I might be being unduly cynical here, whether it's actually quite instrumental in the sense that the, the Labour left realised that, you know, their ability to win power under first past the post and indeed even take over the Labour Party under first past mm. the post, you know, is limited. And then, in fact, they think that, you know, PR will bring them the chance to split away from the Labour Party to create a real socialist alternative. And, and indeed, that's why they, they prefer it rather than necessarily, uh, you know, any great commitment to pluralism more generally. But uh, I mean, I think for some, clearly, you know, you're, you're quite right to say that they are genuinely pluralist. And you can see an organisation like Compass, for example, you, you know, they are very pro working with other mm. parties um, to, you know, bring real reform to the system. Yeah, we should talk a little bit about the Lib Dems, I guess. So on the unity and discipline front, I mean, I think the thing that has really come through in the last year is just how one of the few silver linings from the 2019 general election for my party was the political geography mm. of the held and most winnable seats. Not all of them, but nearly all of them are Tory Lib Dem fights. There are some very important exceptions, but, it, but that uniformity or homogeneity I guess one should say given there are some very exceptions but that but that homogeneity of the political landscape for the next Westminster election for the Lib Dems makes a whole set of policy and strategy choices massively easier mm. uh, I've not actually crunched the numbers but I'm sure that compared to you know the eight the, the 70s the 80s the 90s this is the most straightforward landscape yeah, the party has faced yeah. and Whilst it's really important to remember that, for example, there are lots of badly run Labour councillors in Northern England where absolutely colleagues of mine need to be winning elections in May to be gaining council seats and so on. That, and however flexible one want, want, want to be about the definition of the blue wall, there is a certain consistency of purpose that the geography of the 2019 results has in a way handed the party on a plate and made a lot of issues that otherwise might be much harder, more straightforward, plus the bonus that... Keir Starmer is not Jeremy Corbyn. I think, you know, if you asked a group of Lib Dems before 2019, do you want Jeremy Corbyn or Boris Johnson as Prime Minister? Most would have wanted to dodge the question. And that is in part the genesis of the, albeit very unsuccessful, but the genesis, you can see where the idea came from of Joe Swinson saying, I'm standing to be Prime Minister, because mm -hmm. if that's not what you say, what, you know, what do you say faced with, you know, Johnson versus Corbyn? But now with Starmer, I think you get a group of Lib Dems and ask them nearly all will, you know, with varying degrees of enthusiasm or reluctance, but we'll say, oh yeah, of course, prefer Starmer to Sunak. Mm. That's that's mm. A, a pretty straightforward preference. And again, that makes the basic sort of strategic approach of the party much more straightforward. Yes, I mean, I, I think you're quite right. I mean, the research we did when I was at UK and Changing Europe suggested there's only really kind of four or five at most seats where, you know, the two parties are in direct competition with each other to win the seat coming from second place. Yeah. You know, the, the and as long as we don't name them, no. everyone in several dozen seats can think they're one of those four <laughs> or five. So let's definitely not name them. I, I won't name them. I mean, I guess the, the thing that interests me, in it, I mean, uh, I wanted to ask you in some ways as a, as a mm. Lib Dem, is, uh, is there any chance that, 
Labour's you know, current popularity, if it lasts, is going to lead some people who might otherwise vote for the Lib Dems tactically to vote for, for Labour and therefore in some senses damage the Lib Dems chances in, in some Conservative facing seats. Yeah, I mean, obviously, one thing that happened in 97, for example, was there were several seats where Labour came from third. So mm. Tories first, Lib Dems second, Labour third, where Labour then came from third to leapfrog the Lib Dems mm. to win the seat. So there's definitely a risk of that. Mm. I think what is what is really intriguing is if you look at the YouGov polling, where they ask people to rate on a scale of zero to ten how likely they are to vote for each party. Yeah. And so you've got an average score and it's a tracker. So you've got average scores that move through the year. Yeah. Is if you look at the Tory score, that's fallen away in line with their national voting intention, you know, through this parliament. Labour's one has risen again in line with the national voting. The Lib Dem one, however, has diverged from our headline voting intention. So the Lib Dem average propensity score from YouGov is now where it was in early 2019. Uh-huh. And, you know, early 2019 even saw the Lib Dems very briefly top the opinion polls. Yeah, yeah. Now, that's not to say that I'm going to predict the Lib Dems will top the vote share at the next election by any means. But I think what it illustrates is that there's a huge potential to persuade people to vote Lib Dem. There's a willingness to, which we've seen in the three, you know, dramatic by-election wins for the party in this mm. parliament. Mm. And therefore means that I think in somewhere like Eastbourne, where there's a really good Lib Dem PPC, a really good Lib Dem campaign operation on the ground, etc. One can be really optimistic. The question, or indeed the challenge for, say, someone like me, you know, as given my role in the party, is in how many places can we make sure we have a good enough organisation that that potential, the YouGov 0 to 10 scale shows, is then reflected in actual in actual vote share. And I'm quite optimistic about the opportunity that shows there is for us, but. On the other hand, of course, what the voting intention figures show is that that's an opportunity that we've really got to grasp. It's not something that we can just expect. To be yes, and that, the there right is way. a big political education task there, which, you know, when I was doing my talk at Lewis, I mean, I mentioned, that, you know, there's this work by John Mellon, which looked at how many people could name the second place party mm. in their seat. And it was under a third of people could name the second place party, even though actually most people could name who came first. So you know, it, it really is the, the duty of anyone who wants tactical voting, whether on the Labour side or the, the Liberal Democrat side or indeed any other side, to start educating people yeah. now. Yeah, I'll, I'll yeah. include a link in the show notes if I can find it to that piece, because I remember yeah. I, I wrote about it at the time. Yeah. The reason it stuck in my mind is I, I remember being really confused by one of his graphs. Right. And when I contacted him, it turned out there was a typo, which we explained oh. why I've been confused by the graph. But, but you're right. I mean, it, it comes back to this point about what the overall levels of political knowledge of the public yeah. is. And as you say, knowing who which party your MP comes from, yeah. particularly as there are so many constituencies where that party has basically never changed in 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 yeah. your lifetime, even if you're you know, well, well into the territory of looking forward to getting a telegram from the king on your on your hundredth birthday. You know, they were so many seats where it's not changed mm. uh, but even where it has you know where it has changed it's it, there aren't that many seats where it changes regularly so I think the knowledge of who's first yeah and I guess it's true although I've not seen any figures that who's first changes much less often than who's second in the constituency because yeah. there's a lot of seats that have say have the Lib Dem second or Labour second at various points in the last few decades but have say been consistently Tory. Mm. 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 Yeah, and I was also, one one thing I was going to ask you was something I, I read today, actually, in an offhand comment. I think it was by Robert Shrimsley in mm. a really good piece mm. in, the, in the FT, in which he mentioned North Shropshire and kind of assumed, really, that the, the Lib Dems would lose that mm. again. You know, the Conservatives would obviously regain that. And I wondered to, to what extent, you know, the Lib Dems can do anything about defending those big by-election yeah. wins. I mean, are they well, destined, I this, obviously, I think, to go back or not? Yeah, well, I think this touch, North Shropshire, in a way, illustrates the question about Europe, which you mentioned a little bit earlier, Tim, because I think that broadly, if you look at the opinion polls and focus groups, where public opinion is on Brexit is, lot, you know, an increasing majority of people think Brexit was a mistake, Brexit has gone badly, but oh my goodness, we don't want to bloody fight the Brexit war all over again. And so once you get from, okay, what happened is bad, what happened was a mistake and the consequences are bad, what to do about it. That's when the pro-European majority in the figures 
starts fragmenting. And particularly if you then get into, say, questions around, well, OK, what about the single market and what that means in terms of freedom of movement? The numbers start nosediving. And so you know, if you look at things like the uh, bosses, you know, issues monitor that asks people what's the most important issue facing Britain. The last one had three percent picking Brexit as the most important issue facing their family. Eight percent picking Brexit as the most important issue facing the country. Delta polls similarly had a similar you know, their latest issues question had. Brexit down in single figure. So there's a bit of it. It would. I wish it hadn't happened. It's got horrible consequences. But please don't spend all of your time for the next ten years talking about it again. And so how you navigate that, I think, is quite is a tricky challenge. But I think the one of the advantages of that sort of backdrop in somewhere like North Shropshire is it definitely provides the political space for the Lib Dems to be. Well, look, we're the hardworking campaigners who are picking up these practical problems for export, uh, agricultural regulation, et cetera. And we're campaigning to fix those practical problems. There's, And so I, I, I think the, as we saw in the by-election, you know, you can deal with the consequences of Brexit in a way that wins people who voted leave over without pushing them into, oh, so you're, you're, you're wanting me to stick a Euro flag on my, on my farm, in which case, no, thank you. Yeah. And, and that's, I mean, I think that's the trip the, in a sense, the path that on other issues Keir Starmer is trying to sort of tread as well. But I think the difference is that I think, you know, in the, with the Lib Dems, we're quite clear that, yeah, we do think in the long term, Britain's place is best back in the European Union. But we acknowledge it's not the thing to have dominate government. Yeah, everything government does for the next five years, actually, we need to get on and crack problems with A&E waiting times, crack problems with huge pressures on public surfaces, you know, get more sewage in sewers and not not dumped on beaches and rivers, that there is a sense of people have got other priorities. But within that context, we've got a clear long-term aim. And I think it's a lot less clear what Keir Star what does Keir Starmer really want to do long-term on Europe or immigration or asylum? And, and you know, is, 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 is what he's saying temporary pragmatism to compromise with the electorate for the... For the sake of power, which actually I think is a pretty decent compromise, you know, to, to be willing to think about in a democracy fundamentally, in the end, you know, voters do get to decide. So paying some attention to them has, you know, a certain logic to it. But what does it, where does he really want to end up? And I think we see this as well on constitutional reform again. Does he really believe that political reform is important? Does he really want, you know, does, is, is he genuinely in the long term offended by unelected peers being people who make laws we all have to follow? Or is he just, I don't really care about it. And you know what? The patronage you get from leader of the opposition being able to stick a few people in the Lords every year. That's quite handy patronage. So that's quite a, di that's quite a digression. But maybe well, we Well, it's should... not a digression because it takes us to the, the last in, in the list. Although, you know, we, we'll have to come back and look at another mm. couple. Because in some senses, that is about adaptability, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. Issues. Issues coming up and, you know, Labour and the Liberal Democrats having to, to navigate them. And, and I think, you know, small boats, you know, you refer to immigration is is another one. You know, what what does Labour say about that? Well, actually, it, it doesn't say a great deal about that. Once again, it's doing the, the government could do more, but actually, you know, fairly non-specific about it. Certainly not going to get into defending the rights of asylum seekers uh, as much as some people on the, the left of the Labour Party and perhaps in the Liberal Democrats would would like, you know, responding to a, a changing economic situation. I mean, I think that's going to be really interesting. You know, obviously, at the moment, it's an easy ride in some senses for an opposition because everything's going wrong for the government. But how does the opposition handle the fact that eventually, and probably before the 2024-25 election, the economy will begin to recover, inflation will begin to go down? You know, how does it adjust its, its line uh, when that happens, I think will be quite interesting to see. So the adaptability clearly is, is quite important. And I think probably you'd have to say that Labour at the moment are doing quite, quite well on that. Yeah, and I think for both Labour and the Lib Dems, there's been a huge boost to the adaptability from simply starting to win again. Mm. You know, for the Lib Dems in particular, the three parliamentary by-election wins and the rounds of local council gains, you know, there's that sort of, are we going to be a, a bit, you know, a bit pragmatic about what we prioritise on the next leaflet, et cetera, those sorts mm. of conversations. People are much happier 
to have those conversations if the last set of leaflets you put out resulted in an election win. <laughs> yes. you know? and, and so winning again provides yeah. the ability to be adaptable in many yeah. ways. With Labour, I mean, I think Labour's election wins have been a, a bit less impressive than the Lib Dems. But yeah. on the other hand, their opinion poll ratings have been really impressive. And so, yeah. again, albeit for slightly different reasons. I mean, I was struck by Labour's win in the Ch in the Chester by-election. I mean, was a it was a decent swing. Yeah, but it wasn't. It, it, it wasn't, wasn't a Lib Dem swing. <laughs> it, exactly, it wasn't a Lib Dem swing. It wasn't a Lib Dem swing. But more to the point, it wasn't a mid nineteen nineties Labour by election no. machine no. swing. Now, I think there's a there's a there's a defence one could make of Labour, which is that winning parliamentary by elections on huge swings is actually a very specialised skill. And by the late nineties, Labour had got very good at it. But, you know, I, I, I don't think their by-election machine is yet nearly as good as it got. It, it's also, to be fair to them, harder to win a big swing, I think, when you already hold the seat and when your MP has been forced to step down. <laughs> for True. Although, yeah, although the, the MP quitting in disgrace doesn't tend to really hinder, you no. know, the party because you've very clearly you have... You know, that MP is now persona yeah. non grata, etc. Yeah. But I think, yeah, if you look at the swings in some, you know, Labour held seats in the 90s, I, I don't think Chester yeah. was, that, was that impressive. But nonetheless, with Labour, they've got the opinion poll ratings to look at. So if on adaptability, both opposition parties are doing quite well. Let's have a look. We've got two more criteria. Got visibility and efficiency, visibility. haven't we? Yeah. yeah. I mean, so visibility, I think, is always easier, obviously, for, you know, the main opposition party. And I, I think you'd have to say that, you know, as the government have run into trouble... Labour, you know, is clearly, and we've already referred to this, come up in a mix, as it were, particularly in the media mix. People are taking far more seriously what Labour mm. spokespeople say. Rachel Reeves has been, I think, particularly impressive, actually, over the last few months in response, for example, to the autumn statement. West Streeting, I think, is a bit of a, a media star, to be honest. I think, you know, as questions of, you know, what's going on in the health service will only... I think Mount during the winter, you know, he's going to be quite important. And, and even actually in that respect, I mean, we've seen the Lib Dems get some traction and because it was the Lib Dems who brought out all the figures on ambulance mm. weights, etc. So, you know, the Lib Dems haven't been completely overshadowed. I, I think it is a problem, though, that, you know, <laughs> that the, the media is bound to focus on the government because of the problems it's having and then bound to focus uh, you know, as much now on Labour because, you know, Labour is seen possibly as an alternative government. And that does tend, you know, to put the squeeze really on on the minor parties, unless you have, you know, one big issue like the SNP of independence. It's, it's, it's quite difficult, I think, for, for the Lib Dems to get a hearing. But that's a perennial problem, right? And I think we've done increasingly well in the last year on finding the angle of either being slightly swifter, so calling for a windfall tax, you know, ahead of others, or finding the the research angle, because I think the thing about the A and E waiting times is not only has it got a lot of great national media coverage for the Lib Dems, is the amount of regional and local coverage because yes. there are regional and local numbers within the data that was was dug up by by a whole set of freedom of information requests, and that you know that's your classic opposition party to the press operation. You put in a whole load of, some some poor staffer files hundreds and hundreds of freedom of information requests and every now and again get a whole load of boring answers but sometimes you absolutely hit the jackpot with mm. figures mm. that are both genuinely shocking but also have lots of variation in them so there are all sorts of interesting local and regional stories mm. and I think political punditry in the UK still often somewhat downplays the relevance of local and regional media and just how important that is. The example I always bore colleagues with is from the 2017 general election. Deborah Mattinson, who was not working for Labour Party at the time, her Britain Thinks outfit did a whole set of focus groups. And one of the things they asked was, yeah, what did you notice about the Lib Dem election campaign? One of the three things people most mentioned was our policy on decriminalising cannabis. Yeah. And that wasn't because the party had nationally given it a huge push. It was because the local and regional media absolutely loved it as a story. And mm. so that's how the public noticed it. So if you had, you know, it, it, and in fact, I think even possibly the illustrious, you know, best book on the 2017 general election in its chapter on the Lib Dems doesn't particularly make reference to this policy. Mm. But amongst the public, 
massively noticed it was one of the big features of what the Lib Dems yeah, said because that, of the local and yeah. regional media. And that's why, I mean, I do find it worrying the BBC are going to, you know, have to make these cuts, as they say, in, mm. in local coverage. I think that that is a very worrying thing. And it would be nice to think that perhaps in the long term, you know, more funding could be provided or a funding settlement you know, could be come up with that would allow the BBC to, you know, bring back some of that stuff that it's yeah. going to cut. Because I think for local democracy, and indeed, as you say, in some ways, for kind of national visibility, you know, that that's quite important. I suppose we ought to get on to efficiency. Though, mm. Yeah, so this is the fifth criteria. How efficient and professional. Well, Keir Starmer seems to be able to do reshuffles with more speed, but not necessarily always more professionalism than Jeremy Corbyn, thinking of his botched one from a little while ago now. But overall, what's your impression? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think you would have to say, if you look at, you know, some of the, the ongoing changes that have been made, Labour HQ in terms of, you know, Starmer's media operation, in terms of his policy operation, you know, I think things have got a lot tighter. And, you know, they, they seem to be having all sorts of success on that front. Obviously, people are going to demand that, you know, Labour come up with a whole bunch of policies, you know, far earlier than they want to. But you do feel now that they've probably got a team in there that is is very much capable of, of doing that. And, you know, uh, as I've already said, I think the media operation has been, been excellent. And you've already mentioned the candidate selection operation. I mean, I think, you know, that's obviously highly slick, highly professional, although some people on the left of the Labour Party might not like that fact, but, you know, that that's doing a good job. So so overall, I, I don't think you're seeing, you know, people at the, the centre of the Labour Party sort of dropping the ball in any, any way. And, 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 you know, that clearly does bode well for, for Labour. I mean, I can, I can say in some senses less so about the Lib Dems, other than the fact that, you know, they chose to, to re-elect Mark Pack as their president, which obviously <laughs> shows a, a commitment to professionalism and efficiency. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I, I think the thing that is most strikes me about the Labour operation is all of the you know, the things like the little snide comments in the Politico daily morning email about slowness of Labour press releases appearing that used to be commonplace. That all seems to have fallen, fallen by the wayside. And there does seem to be a just a general sense of running things competently, whether or not one agrees with the purpose for which they're being done. You know, that, that that's being done. But I think that is quite striking. I, and obviously, you would expect me to have a very positive story to say about the Lib Dems, you know, and us learning our lessons from from 2019. But I I think it's I think it's fair to say that, you know, our, you know, our current chief exec, for example, is at least as good, if not better than any previous chief mm. exec, you know, the party has, has had. I think there is a real sense of I'm, I'm very struck when I do you know, local party, well, Zoom calls often these days or, or visits in person, you know, you can get a sense of what people think about the party's administration and so on from what the questions are that people ask. And there's an awful lot less about why the heck did HQ did the fo do the following than there used to be. There's, there's always the running sore about why do I not get emails from the party and all sorts of things to dig into and untangle to sort out on that. But it, 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 there's been, I think, a very noticeable change in the the, to the topics of those questions over the last few yeah, years yeah. and I do think if I was if I was if I was asked by somebody to, you know say well look I think I'm doing some research on British politics and you know I'm, I'm gonna you know I'm, I'm happy to sort of have this as a relatively long-term research project what what do you think might be data that's interesting to gather that you know nobody really gathers I think getting people who do the rubber chicken circuit in each party to methodically record what questions they get asked through a parliament yeah. by their members would be an absolutely yeah. fascinating yeah. but also quite revealing insight into the dynamics of the I internal party mood mm -hmm. and obviously there's like, all sorts of caveats about you know the atypicality of it but I think you can really you know, I certainly I feel in the Lib Dems you can really track mm -hmm. how things have changed in the party through what the the topics yeah. are of the questions yeah. yeah i mean the other aspect of this i mean i to echo what you said about the the lib dem ceo there used to be from the left quite a lot of criticism of um, david evans the, the general mm. secretary of the labor party that has disappeared uh, mm. as far as i can see completely at least publicly and the other aspect and i don't know if you want to comment on this on, on the lib dems of, of, of labor's you know increased efficiency or professionalism is their fundraising you know mm. we just had figures from the electoral commission that showed that in the third quarter of 2022 they raised as much if not a little bit more money perhaps than the conservatives which you know suggests that you know they've got their act together on that front as well 
Yeah, and if, I mean, if you look at those figures, the Lib Dem figures are pretty decent. They're not, because in some previous parliaments we had spectacularly good fundraising, that they, they're figures that aren't so easy to turn into a really positive headline of, you know, record <laughs> fundraising or anything, you know, because, but when you take into account that we're no longer in that sort of Brexit fundraising boom, actually you look at those Lib Dem figures, they're very, you know, they are very promising. And I think what is notable, I mean, I was at a Christmas sort of thank you party for some of our donors a few days ago, is just both the number of people in the room, but the number of faces that are not the faces that would have always been at such an event. Mm -hmm that there is a sense of amongst not just donors but amongst you know voters and indeed the media crucially as well a sense of the relevance of the party that despite the fact that we're still sadly you know fourth party in terms of MPs in the House of Commons at the moment there is a sense of the Lib Dems being part of the British political story in a way that very easily could have could have not been the case in this parliament after the 2019 result we yeah. could have very easily faded into being a obscure footnote and i think that although one you know the, the the role and influence of donors in politics is always quite a sort of a an interesting question <laughs> to discuss <laughs> i think there is always something interesting about the mood of donors because those are people who are actually coughing up their own money yeah. Yeah. because they think it's something that will be worthwhile yeah. And therefore, when donors have confidence in a party, that does illustrate illustrate something. And donors often actually get to see more of the insides of things like internal party data and so on than than that you know than the average average journalist or average political scientist does. So I think the confidence that donors have at the moment in both Labour and the Liberal Democrats it's is significant not only for the amount of money that it brings in, but also what it tells you about what they have discerned about each of those parties from seeing those parties up close. Seconded. So I guess thinking about those five criteria, fresh faces, unity and discipline, visibility, efficiency and professionalism, and adaptability to circumstances. Is there anything that you feel is just really missing from that list, thinking about 2023, where actually, you know what, there's something else. Because I think those probably do cover what's going to be the key... Yeah, I, th I think so. I mean, I, I think there's always going to be a demand, clearly, uh, as I said earlier, for, you know, the main opposition party and indeed for the Lib Dems to start coming up with policies to answer the, well, what would you do about it question? But it's something I think that parties, you know, have to resist doing in any great detail, but they still need to give people a sense of, you know, the the, the direction, mm. if you like. And I, and I think probably you could say about Labour that it hasn't quite managed to do that yet. So it's going to have to work on that. But no, overall, I think for Labour and indeed for the Liberal Democrats, you know, 2022 has been a, a pretty good year, but partly, as you say, because for the Conservatives, it's been a really, really yeah. bad year. Yeah. And the Conservatives continue to offer up enough sort of totemic policies that you can clearly signal a difference from them without having to go into huge detail. So things like cutting the tax on banks, that, you know, in the overall fiscal scheme of things is an important but relatively small policy, but it's so clearly totemic that opposing that gives a really clear symbol of a difference of approach yeah. that, that you don't necessarily have to have fully backed up with all the rest of of what all of all of your other fiscal policy differences would be that you can focus in on here is the symbolic difference. Yeah, likewise for Labour, different. you know, likewise for Labour, you know, removing the VAT exemptions from private schools, mm. uh, for example, you know, that would be an, uh, another good example of just such a policy. I mean, in the end, it doesn't, you know, I mean, it's not negligible the, the amount of money that removing charitable status would be, but it's it's certainly not going to solve. <laughs> it's um, neither a tax nor an education policy, but it is a uh, very... yeah. It is a very powerful symbol yes, of the exactly, sort of exactly. approach you would take. And I, yeah. I think that's what both, and you know, for the Lib Dems, things like the windfall tax, I think has fulfilled a similar purpose. Mm. And I think particularly for the Lib Dems, where we don't we don't get enough media coverage to, in a sense, be able to set out the full plan. You mm. need to have the symbolic policy yeah. that give, has a chance of media cut through, but gives a clue as to what the bigger picture is. Yeah. And indeed, I think going back to those 2017 focus groups, the problem for the Lib Dems in the 2017 election was the three things people noticed were essentially were decriminalising cannabis, being pro-European, Tim Farron's views on abortion. Mm. 
Mm. And so there was one really cruel and unfair and inaccurate, but also I think quite powerful focus group quote where somebody said something like, I don't understand the Lib Dems. They want to criminalise abortion and decriminalise drugs. And the problem was, you know, in that sense, the three things people noticed didn't add up to a coherent yeah. overall direction. Yeah. When if they if it had been three things that all pointed in the same direction, it would have been a very different, very different story. So we'll have to return in a year's time to see how horribly wrong or not our prognosis about what will matter in 2023 is. But in the meantime, you have a bit of a reputation for writing books, Tim. So I suspect there is at least one new book from you imminent that people should be looking forward to next year yeah there's the conservatives after brett turmoil and transformation is the the subtitle i, I guess and what time span does that result. cover because that could cover a year a decade or a century you know, i feel it, it, <laughs> with a it actually like starts that. with david cameron resigning on the day after yeah. the referendum and goes mm. right up to sunak winning the leadership yeah. or at least being handed the leadership so yeah i mean it, it covers a a really uh, i guess you know vital time in British politics in all sorts of ways. It, it covers it using a narrative, but hopefully a reasonably analytical narrative. And it tries to get at both at the, the top of the party and the bottom of the party as well, because obviously we've done a lot of work on membership and, and their views. And so the interaction of, of those two is a, a theme in the book. But that comes out on March the 30th. So thanks very much for the, yeah. for the I will. I will include a link to it. Is it available for pre-order as yet? It is. It is. And I will include links in the show notes. People can buy themselves a Christmas present by pre-ordering <laughs> it for next year. I, depending on what happens in British politics, I can easily imagine a third edition in 15 years' time where you've got the same title and you've just extended the narrative for another 10 years. <laughs> yeah, there'll probably there'll need to be a bit more room made for different leaders, I suspect. We've just about managed to fit four on the cover in the end, but <laughs> any more than that might be a bit difficult. I, I, I really did feel for your cover designer as, <laughs> as events were unfurling earlier this year. Earlier this year. Yeah, but thank you so much for your time, Tim. If people are impressed by what Tim has said or outraged by what I have said, you can find Tim on Twitter at Prof Tim Bale, myself at Mark Pack, and this podcast at Bar Chart Podcast. Do look out in the show notes for links to Tim's new book, uh, the John Mellon research that we mentioned, and the previous episodes where you can see how well or not Tim and I foretold the political future on our previous outings. And if you like listening, please do tell others about this podcast and give it a rating or review in your favourite or indeed your least favourite podcast app. Thank you everyone for listening. Music.